layers, but be optimistic about the coming of sunshine and of warmer weather, but I know that we do need this moisture. And I'm so happy to see so many of you here today um, getting, yep, and it's good to see the smile on the children and hear the children's voices this morning. It's just going to be a wonderful day. You know, something that I think about almost every Sunday is what is it that draws people to come to worship? And what is it that, why, why are we gathering? Do you ask yourself that sometimes? Like, why are we gathering? Well, today my prayer for you is that you have come, you have gathered together to be part of a community, to, to focus on the cross, but also to have the sense of community, the sense that you are with people who you can have a conversation about Jesus with, and that you know that your faith is drawing you in the same direction of finding people that need to be loved, of having people that will love you. So my hope is that you have gathered here today so that you know that you are loved by me, by each other, and by God. So quite a few announcements, and I'm going to have you read those in your bulletin, but there's a few that I really need to highlight. We, are, we have a very busy month coming up with uh, last things, with graduations, with the end of the school year, and we have three more weeks of meals for Spark Kids. And we have a sign-up sheet that is by the treats. So as you're going through, if you would be willing to put your name down and help, we do, we get the food really pretty much ready for you, but we need help with setting up, serving, and cleaning up. So if that's something you could do for us, pick one of the three weeks in May and sign up, that would be fantastic. And then stay and eat with the kids, because we, they love to see members of our congregation be with them. And on that note, there is not Wednesday night worship during the day. I'm going to be spending some extra time with our confirmation kids. So those of you who traditionally come, come for the Wednesday night services, come and eat. Um, but there will not be worship service. And then our next Wednesday night worship service will be around the campfire starting the first Wednesday in June. So hopefully you can join us for that. It's a really fun, fun opportunity to worship outside. And then for our graduation breakfast, our tradition here is we invite the graduates and their families and friends, and we serve them a meal that's the Saturday, the same day as their graduation. And we've got quite a few of you who have already signed up, but we could use a few more to help with cleanup, as always. That's always the hardest one. Um, and maybe some more fruit. But check those sign-up sheets. That would be fantastic. And then a prayer request that I have for you that... Some of you know Pastor Jeremy from Hill City. Pastor Jeremy uh, recently donated a kidney to one of his colleagues and mentors in Salt Lake City. And so last Tuesday morning, he's been working on it for months and months to make sure he was a match for this person, and he was a perfect match. So Tuesday morning, they removed his kidney, put it on a jet, flew it to Salt Lake City, and, and his, the donor received the kidney. And as of today, they are both doing very, very well. But I ask that you continue to pray for their recovery and for the successful transplant of Pastor Joel's kidney. So keep them in your prayers, Pastor Jeremy and Pastor Joel. Are there any other announcements that I need to make for any of you before we begin our service? If not, then I would invite you to, as you prepare your hearts and minds for worship this morning, to contemplate times where you have felt deeply loved in a worship space or a worship setting. And who was it, or how was it, that you came to feel so very loved by your church or by people of faith? So let's take a moment to gather our hearts and our minds and prepare for worship. We gather this morning for worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our call to worship. <clears throat> Come, let us serve one another in Christ. As Christ loved and served, so will we. Come, let us serve one another in Christ. We will rejoice in the love of this community. We confess our sins before God and one another. We can 
confess to you, to ourselves, and to one another, that we have caused harm by the things we have said and done, and by the things we have not said and not done. Take away our sins, that we might fully abide in your commands, to love you with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. In grace and mercy, God forgives all our sins, and with joy and expectation calls us into new life for the sake of the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join me in our gathering hymn number 392. <laughs>
community. You call us into loving and supportive relationships with one another in our church's family. Through the Holy Spirit, unify our hearts and minds that together we might strive to bring your healing grace into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and I'd like to invite any children who'd like to come forward for the Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul 
crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I was baptized, that I baptized <coughs> none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God. Jesus was either thrown in jail 
or kicked out of their community, and perhaps some of them even lost their lives because they admitted to being followers of Jesus. So I have to tell you that that doesn't really make me like Paul very much in the first part of his life. How about you? That's kind of a hard thing to know about him, and I'm not sure we talk about that very much. But in the book of Acts, if you read the whole book of Acts, you can find the story about all of a sudden, Paul had this revelation where he, was, he fell off of his horse, and he was blinded. It was as if scales had fallen over his eyes, and he couldn't see anything. And he was panicking, and he didn't know what was going on. And he heard the voice of Jesus say, Why are you persecuting me? And, and Paul knew. He just, had, he just knew that this was Jesus talking to him. And so from that moment on, Paul had a complete conversion. And he spent the rest of his life feeling anguish and guilt and sorrow for what he had done in his previous life. And then to compensate for it, he spent the rest of his life trying to tell people about Jesus and about Jesus' love. So as we read these letters, you're going to hear Paul's own anguish based upon his former life. You're going to hear Paul's hope for his churches, for the world, and for us today. So when we read these letters or hear these letters, I would like for us to listen to them as if he's really writing to Custom Luther Fellowship. Or if you're visiting and you have your own home church to that church that Paul is writing to us. The other little bit of Bible 101 that I think is interesting just to share is we know that when we pick up our, our Bibles, Matthew, I'm going to start right here at Matthew, this is the, can you see the difference? The Old Testament is this thick part, the New Testament is this part. But we as Christians claim the whole Bible as Holy Scripture and Sacred Scripture. But you should know that Paul would have known every single word of this first part of the Hebrew scripture of the Old Testament. And that is what he was living by. He was so convicted by the words of scripture that that was how he had designed his life. And he had understood these words to call him into a life of persecution of Christians. He was not a bad man. And then once he had this conversion experience and he started writing these letters, a little fun fact, I asked my confirmation kids, and I don't know that any of them are here to answer this, so they won't spoil it for you. I'm going to ask you, raise your hand if you know why Paul's letters are in the order that they are in the Bible. I said, raise your hand. No. <laughs> They are not in chronological order. But Paul's letter to the Romans was the longest one, so that's the first one. And then the Corinthians and so on. But the, they, so good job. Those, I did see a few other hands. In fact, what I really thought I would see is I thought I would see the pastors that are here with their hands up. <laughs> <laughs> not to call you out. <laughs> Would you please raise your hand? One, two, three, four, five. And I'll raise mine. Six. We have six pastors in the room today. So, imagine this. Imagine I said, okay, we are going to ask the six pastors to come up here in front. And then, you get to vote on who your favorite pastor is. <laughs> And it was not an easy time. 
It was not an easy time to be a follower of Jesus because there were so many other religions, so many other philosophies, so many other divisive factors in the community of Corinth. There were politicians who said, you have to follow exactly what I say or you are not doing your religion right. There were pastors who said, this is exactly what the Bible means and you better do exactly what the Bible says or you are doing it wrong. And there were pastors that said, um, Jesus really wasn't the son of God. Jesus was just a really great guy and he had some really great messages. And we'll learn about him, but we're not going to worship him. As I was writing these notes for the sermon, I realized it sounds very much like today, doesn't it? Do we have politicians from every end of the spectrum who are vying for our allegiance? Especially now, and we are entering into this time where we are going to have to make a choice about which politicians we're going to support. But I am going to implore you to know that Jesus is not a politician. Jesus is not asking you to pledge allegiance to him. Jesus is asking us to trust him. Jesus is asking us to follow him. And as Jesus does that, and he sits his disciples down, and he said, you may think you know more than everybody else. And you may think you know more than everybody else, but the truth is, what it means to follow me is to be servant of all. So we are not vying for power. We are not vying for popularity. We are not vying to glorify ourselves. What we do, brothers and sisters, as Christians, is we serve each other. We love each other. And we figure out how to do that in the name of Jesus. It is not the pastor, the church of Shannon, or the church of any of the other pastors who raise their hands here. This is the church where we come to humble ourselves low enough so that we can actually appreciate what Jesus did on the cross. Paul's words to the Corinthians were that we understand the foolishness of the cross, that it becomes a stumbling block for all of us. As soon as we want to elevate ourselves to be the best, the brightest, and the most, we realize that it was through his death that Jesus taught us about love. Through the pain that he endured to go to all of these different places, through the, through, through the world, through the countryside, through the cities, where he went and he sat with prostitutes, and tax collectors, and sinners. Where he welcomed and healed and physically laid his hands on the lepers, those who were dying, those who had been excluded by the Bible themselves from the community. Jesus physically touched them and welcomed them back into the community. And it made people mad. So, friends of Jesus, sometimes loving people is hard work. Sometimes it makes people mad. Why is it that Jesus' love, that the grace that we have received through the power of the cross is so much harder for us to accept and receive than the law. Every single one of us, every single one of us should raise our hands when we say, love is much harder than the law. It's so much easier for us to judge people, criticize people, especially ourselves. Anybody here ever been hard on themselves before? Anybody ever had a hard time receiving the grace and love and forgiveness of Jesus for yourself on a regular basis? So maybe we can start there. Maybe you can sit beside Jesus and hear him say to you, you are my disciples. I have called you here. And I ask that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And you know how you do that? You love each other. That's, it's that simple. But it's not easy. Simple does not always be easy. And so, Pastor Luther Fellowship and any of the visitors who have a church of your own, it's important for us to think about what is the most important thing? What do we hold on to as Christians? 
I was reading a story about a woman who was talking about just this on a, on a blog called Reflectionary, and it was a really good example. She said, let's think about the Titanic. And let's think about if you are one of the people on the upper floor of the Titanic, and you are walking proudly with your glass of champagne, and all of a sudden something moves between beneath your feet, and you're going to protect your beautiful clothes so that champagne doesn't spill on your clothes, right? And then you keep walking and all of a sudden it's shaking so hard that you've dropped your purse, the wind is blowing your beautiful hat off, and you're pretty soon, you throw that bottle of champagne and you're going to try to protect yourself. Suddenly the champagne doesn't become so important. But then all of a sudden you're reaching for your bag and your hat and all the things that are falling off and the, the jolt gets even bigger and somebody hands you a life jacket. Suddenly, nothing else but the life jacket becomes important. Friends, Jesus is that life jacket that will be wrapped around us, that will hold us in all of the tumult of life. It will carry us as children, through adolescence, through our young adulthood, into our old age. Jesus will hold on to us when the world feels like it's falling apart. That is the love that we can offer to each other. That is how we can learn to trust Jesus. Not to bring glory to ourselves or to custom with your fellowship, to remind people of the love of Jesus Christ, who gave his life, who died for us, and was resurrected so that we might continue to follow him, to love him, and to love each other. It's as simple as that. Amen.
church for generations, we confess together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in the promise of the resurrection, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Saving God, the message of the cross, is utter foolishness to the powerful. Give us the strength and conviction to proclaim and to model your sacrificial love and leadership in all we say and do. God of new life, in your mercy hear our prayer. Your blessed creation is in need of our loving care and restoration. Unite us in our efforts to protect this earth so that we all might reap the benefits of the abundance of all that you have given to us throughout the world. God of new life, gracious God, we fervently pray that you keep all elected officials and all who are running for office at every level to focus on the things that truly matter, that they might work towards your reign of justice and equity and peace for all throughout the world. God of new life, Gracious God, we know that there are many in our communities who are suffering in mind, body, and spirit. And we lift them before you in the silence of our hearts. Surround them with your peace, your hope, and your healing. And also be with their caretakers, the professionals, or their family members or communities who lives are affected by their suffering. God of new life. In mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we know that you see us as the humans that we are, that there are disagreements and divisions with one another. But we pray that you guide us to, toward what we have in common, and that is our faith and trust in your Son. And so help us to work together, to speak kindly to each other, to listen to one another, to be forgiving to one another, but also to trust that you love each and every one of us equally. God of new life, in mercy we are With gratitude we remember all the peacemakers throughout history who have united and strengthened the body of Christ for their calm guidance. May we in turn bring peace and unity to our own faith community. We ask that you bless the many ministries of Custer Lutheran Fellowship and the ministries of churches throughout this community and the world, that, they, that you might breathe your new life into them. God of new life, in mercy hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Not only are we a people that have received the grace and forgiveness of Jesus, we are a people that can share this peace with each other. Peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us share that peace.
kind of mindset and lost for words. And the funny thing is, it's okay. Last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear. You would say, would God speak? Would you pour down my brain? Washing my eyes to see your majesty be still and know you're in this place. Please let me stay.
and the Word became flesh and indeed dwells among us. And so we remember the night that Jesus was betrayed, and he took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, This is my body. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And he pours out his spirit upon this cup and upon this bread and upon all of us so that we may receive his grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And so we are bold to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us and as you are comfortable holding the hand of somebody beside you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now we are invited to come to this table. We are all invited. If we have come here to worship Jesus, we are welcome at this table. As you come forward, an usher will give you a small piece of bread, and another usher will give you a, a cup. And in the center of the trays, there are white, that is the wine, and around the edges, that is the grape juice. You can receive either of them and then place it in the basket. And also, if you need gluten-free, there's a little tray that you would help yourself to um, the, those pieces of gluten-free community. But now at this time, I invite you all to come forward to taste and see that the Lord is good. The ushers will guide you to the railing, and then as you, after you receive the bread and the wine, I will come behind you to offer a blessing before you go back to your seats. You may be seated.
Yeah.